Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. You know, we have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand and to truly appreciate the broader historical context in which most of these events occur. During each episode of this program, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historic context in which they occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the questions are, why are American neocons hell-bent on starting a conflict with Russia? What's going on in Ukraine? Who was Alexei Navalny and is NATO really still relevant? For insight into all of this, let's turn to my guest. He's a former U.S. Marine Corps intelligence officer who served in the former Soviet Union implementing arms control treaties in the Persian Gulf during Operation Desert Storm and in Iraq overseeing the disarmament of WMD. His most recent book is entitled Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika. He is Scott Ritter. Scott, welcome. Thanks for joining me and let's connect some dots. Well, thanks for having me. And I, first of all, I have to say, I love the, um, the name of your show. Uh, in the intelligence business, uh, connecting the dots is what we do. Um, you know, you never, you never get the full picture. You get little pieces of information. And the, the question is, you know, how do you connect them to get a proper narrative? So I, uh, I, I like, I like, I like the idea. <laughs> well, I pre thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, so the answers to each of these questions, I think could be a show of their own, but let's start with the, uh, in 2024, why are neocons so afraid of Russia? I mean, when we go back to this nauseating ongoing narrative, Hillary Clinton, blamed Russia for hacking into the DNC server. No evidence was presented, but the narrative held and continues to hold in spite of scientific empiric evidence to the contrary. The whole Russiagate fiasco. Even now, Representative Mike Turner from Ohio, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, he warns that Russia may be developing a space-based weapon that could target U.S. satellites NBC reported on the uh, 19th of this month alarming new warnings about Russia held Zaporozhye nuclear power plant may be on the verge of explosion. These are just a few examples. And we'll get to the specifics of each of these in a few, but just some these are just some overarching examples of this this Russia phobia. Why? Well, I mean, let's just look at uh historic uh, examples at the end of the Second World War, you know, we had built up this uh, economy that was. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people forget that before the Second World War happened, we had a thing called the Great Depression, and um, you know, our economy was not the healthiest in the world, and we used uh, global war as a way to mobilize our economy to uh, to get it up to war footing. And there was a recognition that you know, with 12 million guys coming home. Um, you know, we needed jobs. And if we tried to transition, transition back to a civilian economy, um, you know, we, we ran the danger of going backwards instead of forward. So we had to keep this military industrial complex up and running, but to do that, you need an enemy. You need a bad guy. Uh, there, therefore we have the iron curtain, Winston Churchill's, uh, Fulton, uh, Missouri speech. And I think 1946, the creation of NATO. Um, and then the Red Scare. I mean, Russia's always been communism back then, not just Russia, but communist China was always uh, the perfect boogeyman to say, ooh, danger lurks. We therefore, you know, now have a justification to, um, you know, militarize our economy and, uh, and back this up, you know, politically by pointing to this threat. You know, back in the 50s, we had the bomber gap. You remember that? Uh, well, oh, you yeah. Mean, you know, oh, we've oh. read about it. Right. A little <laughs> yeah, before my time, but I got you. Yeah, I mean, we weren't around back then. We're old, Wilmer, but we're not that <laughs> old. old. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but the, the idea of, I think the Russians took, you know, they had like a dozen bombers. 
but on a on a on a military parade, they just flew them over and over and over again in a circle over Moscow. And the people on the ground looked up and said, oh, my goodness, there's a whole bunch of bombers. Um, and so the CIA used this, the Congress used this to justify building more American bombers, even though once we got our satellites up, we went, there's only 12. <laughs> There's not that many, but we never told the truth. We can. Then there was the missile gap. John F. Kennedy was responsible for that one too. You know, the Russians have missiles. We have to build missiles, 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 um, and, until we found out that they didn't have the missiles. But it didn't matter. We continued to build them anyways. And this led to the Cuban missiles crisis, which scared the living you know what out of everybody, um, and got us on the path of, you know, arms control at least mm -hmm. uh, trying to contain. But we still called them the threat. That's all that's happening here. I, I can guarantee you this, Wilmer. The neocons aren't looking for a war with Russia because as politically biased as they are, as fear-mongering as they are, they're not suicidal. Uh, and they know what the consequences of a war with Russia would be. But what they're doing is they're pushing it right up to the cusp of conflict, um, especially now when you have an American society that's sort of waking up to the fact that we're spending a lot of money over there when we need to be spending a lot of money back here at home and people are starting to ask questions. So the way that you avoid answering these questions is to create that, you know, that, that straw man, that threat, you know, the Russian threat, the Russians are evil. And you, 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 you said it perfectly. You know, they interfere with our election. They're doing this, that, and the other thing. And therefore we must spend $64 billion in, in Ukraine, even though we can't spend $64 million in Flint, Michigan. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's this sort of argument that's going on. Talk, and this may seem as a sophomoric or a juvenile question, but uh, how dangerous is this? Uh, World War I was, to a great degree, started on a fluke. It is, in many instances or in many minds, attributable to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, but that in and of itself isn't what started the war. There were a number of skirmishes and a number of tensions that were going on in Europe. And this was really just the spark that led to World War I, if my understanding of history is accurate. So do we find ourselves now, whether it be Russia and Ukraine, uh, uh, China and Taiwan, North Korea and South Korea, I mean, the United States, what's going on in Venezuela as the United States is interfering in the Venezuelan elections? There are a number, of course, we've got Gaza in the Middle East. So we're, we've got our hands, we're, we're, we're smoking at the gas station and smoking at a lot of gas stations. I'm going to steal that, by the way. I like that analogy. <laughs> Just letting everybody know I'm using that from now on. Um, look, first of all, there's no such thing as a sophomore question. The um, the one thing I, I learned, and I learned this from guys who are 20 times smarter than me, that the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. You don't ask. Um, you know, and, but you're 100% right. You know, Barbara Tuckman wrote a book, um, the, the the Guns of August, I think it was, a Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize winning book about how we got to uh, World War I. And, um, you know, one of the key aspects to that wasn't just the the, the different crises that were taking place, but how people responded to that. And um, the, the, the thing that made World War I inevitable, even though everybody, if you read the book, it, everybody in the summer of 1914, nobody wanted war. Everybody believed it, could, it would be avoided because it was just suicidal. But then they got into this cycle of mobilization, mobilizing their societies uh, economically and militarily for conflict because that's just what you did when you had a crisis. But it's okay. We're, we're just mobilizing and we're not really going to war. Um, what scares me about today is there's a recognition on the part of everybody that war would be suicidal, that, that we don't want this, but what, 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 look at what we've done. We built up the Ukrainian military from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands and, and got it, um, equipped, organized, trained, uh, to go to war against Russia. What do you think we were doing in Ukraine from 2015 to 2022? when we were training a battalion of Ukrainian soldiers every 55 days for the sole purpose of fighting Russians. Um, this helped trigger a conflict. It got Russia to respond. Then we poured more money into Ukraine. What did Russia do? Mobilized. 
People need to put on their, 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 their hats and go, wait a minute, that's a word we don't want to hear. Russia mobilized not just the 300,000, but the process of mobilization continued to where they trained 450,000 volunteers. Uh, since January 1st, just for everybody who's wondering what's going on in Ukraine, I know that's going to be later on, of course, mm -hmm. Russia mobilized 53,000 volunteers. This is at a time when Ukraine's thumping people on the head and, uh, and taking them to the front because nobody wants to fight. 53,000 Russians volunteered to go fight in the war since January 1st. They're coming in at 1,000, 1,500 a day. Um, and let me, let me reiterate, that's not press gangs like they're using in Russia, roaming the villages, taking the men and now women from the streets and putting them into the military. That's not conscription. That's volunteer. And let me let me make this following point. It's even more interesting than that. It's not a bunch of um, 22-year-old, you know, red meat eating young men who are looking for adventure and romance. The average age of the Russian volunteer going in is about 35 years old. He's married, he has a family, and he has a job. It's the last person in the world that you'd expect a volunteer to go to a war zone. And yet they're doing it because they love their country, because they say, we have to do that. Does this, what's going on right now is an existential struggle for the survival of Russia against the collective West, which again speaks to the danger of mobilization because Russia is a nation that is mobilizing and has the potential to mobilize even more if necessary. And this should scare the heck out of everybody in NATO because right now you have NATO. What's NATO talking about doing, Wilmer? Mobilizing. They're talking about mobilizing. You have everybody in NATO saying, well, so they, they never say, well, since we kicked this hornet's nest and the hornets are now coming out and stinging us, um, you know, maybe we should stop kicking the hornet's nest. They don't acknowledge the role they played in building the Ukrainian army to trigger this. But what they're saying now is, oh, because Russia now has mobilized and is defeating the proxy army that we built, we have to mobilize in turn. And you have Brits talking about general mobilization, Germans. Boom. And what this does, now you're a Russian, you're sitting there going, huh, they're talking about mobilizing. Well, if they do that, what do we have to do? I mean, Finland just joined NATO. We, we really don't care until they put on NATO Russia's troops. border. In, in, pardon? On Russia's border. On Russia's border until they put NATO troops there. Now Russia has to say, well, we didn't want to do this. But to give you an example, we keep the, the term is mobilized, Wilmer. Russia was compelled to create a new military district, the St. Petersburg Military District, because Finland joined NATO. There wasn't a St. Petersburg Military District. Russia didn't have 70,000 combat troops on the Finnish border uh, until Finland joined NATO. Now Russia has built mobilized Wilmer. They put in 70,000 frontline troops, divisions, ready to march on Helsinki, not because they wanted to, but because they were compelled to by the mobilization. Bringing Finland and Sweden into NATO is a form of mobilization. What we have here is we are moving in the wrong direction. We are accumulating military power in Europe. And at some point in time, you're smoking at the gas yeah. station. And uh, it's going to go have to. I'm going to have to use that one, Scott. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, so Feel free. <laughs> th <clears throat> so this time last year, Ukraine was on the front page of every newspaper. As of the morning of that we're taping this conversation, I don't see Ukraine referenced. Uh, let, and, and let me suggest, folks, read. I don't know if you've read uh, Nikolai Petro and Ted Snyder's piece to end the war in Ukraine expose its core lie. Let me read two quick quick paragraphs. The, this is how it opens. The essential argument used to avoid negotiation and continue support for the war in Ukraine is based on a falsehood. That falsehood, repeated by President Biden, is that when Putin decided to invade, which we can debate that word, he intended to conquer all of Ukraine and annihilate it. Its falsity has been exposed multiple times by military experts who have pointed out both before and after the invasion that Russia could not have intended to conquer all of Ukraine because it did not invade with sufficient forces to do so. Scott Ritter. Well, look, that, that was my argument all along. I, I kept mm -hmm. saying, you know, 
they're only going in with around 200,000. Uh, Ukraine at the start of the war had around 770,000. And I went, the normal attack defender ratio is supposed to be three to one in favor of the attacker. And Russia's going in with a one to three disadvantage. Um, we Why? And the answer was because they weren't trying to occupy Ukraine. They were trying to. Oh, no, Ukraine. it's because Russians can't do math. Well, that too. And, and, <laughs> okay. And, and, okay. I mean, you know, you know, I must be <laughs> Russian because I'm not very good at math either. But uh, my military math, uh, you know, was like, this isn't adding up. But Russia's goal is to get them to a negotiating table. Um, but I also then when Russia mobilized, because I, I basically said that Russia is going to have to get 500, 600,000 men to stabilize the front line just to stabilize the front line. Mm -hmm. And they mobilized to do that. And then people said, well, they're going to go on to Odessa. They're going to, and I went, if they go on to Odessa, they're going to need around 900,000 guys to go on to Odessa and take those things. Russia's got about 900,000 guys there now. So they have enough troops to do that, but to go on to Poland, they're going to need about 1.5 million guys. They don't have that. And to go from Poland to Germany, they're going to need around 3 million guys. It's just basic military math. I mean, I could bore you all day about how I come up with these numbers, but it's the logistics of war. It's the scope and scale of the fronts, how to protect flanks, how to sustain offensive operations. The math doesn't lie. I'm pretty good with those numbers. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and Russia doesn't have it. And you know, here's the thing. We know this. I mean, there's, there's, look, I'm, I, I was a major. And I only was a major for a little while. My my the main part of my military life was spent as a captain. Mm -hmm. Now captains are pretty cool, but we're not seniors. We're not you know the the most senior people in the world. So I admit that you know my perspective was a captain's perspective at senior headquarters. I saw the big picture, but um, you know, but I know enough to know what it takes to move troops. I I was part of moving seven hundred fifty thousand troops into the Middle East. I know what a tip fiddle is. Time phase deployment. Uh, list, you know, how to surge things in. I planned a core sized operation on how to, and, and, and had to plan on the logistic sustainability of that. I'm pretty good with the numbers. And so are the people in the Pentagon who are more senior than I am. People mm -hmm. who, you know, see the bigger picture in more detail. They know what I'm talking about too. And they know you, you, no matter how much you talk up somebody, you're only as good as your logistics. <laughs> you know? I mean, you can have the Lamborghini, but if mm -hmm. you ain't got the gasoline, you don't have anything. You have a piece of metal sitting in your driveway, mm -hmm. but you got to have the gas and you got to have the gas sustained. You got to be able to maintain it, fix it. Lamborghinis break. Uh, you got to have people trained to drive the Lamborghini. Uh, we can talk the Russians up all we want to about this, that, and the other thing. But the bottom line is they're only human and they, they can only do that, which is physically possible to do. And they don't have the troops to invade NATO, to drive on NATO. It's a 100% fabrication on the part of these people to justify their own mobilization. But everybody knows that Russia can't. Right now, Russia has sufficient troops to take Odessa, to take Kharkov, to take Mikolaev, to take Nepopetros. That's it. They can't do anything more than that. If they want to drive on Kiev, they're going to need another 300,000 troops up in Belarus that they don't have right now. So, you know, pe people just have to put on their thinking caps and, um, and, 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 and think rationally. But right now, rational thought isn't in the cards, apparently. You know a hell of a lot more about this than I do. You, you, you speak the language. You, you, you listen to the broadcast. I listen to you and, <laughs> and other folks. Um, <laughs> I, but I, when I keep hearing statements about what Russia is going to do. The one thing that I never hear following that is evidence to support the position. Russia wants to take over Europe. I've never heard President Putin say that. I've never read anything that coming out of Russia that says that. All I hear is Nikki Haley and uh, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala, you know, I, there's a I, there's a litany of folks that'll tell me that, but I haven't seen them present one video of President Putin standing at a podium uh, or, or, or taking off his shoe like Stalin and pounding on the podium saying, I'm kicking your... And the other point is, 80% of what I see is defensive 
not offensive. Here's another one you might want to use. Don't start nothing, won't be nothing. And it seems it's Joe Biden would just shut the fuck up. And, and Wilmer, <laughs> you're using my language. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a Marine. Um, so, okay, you get my point. Scott Ritter. Well, you know, here, here's the thing. If you if we go back to the December, January, December 2021, January 22 time frame, mm -hmm. uh, the, the U.S. government is running going, Russia's going to invade, Russia's going to invade. Now, they may have had some intelligence about Russia moving up logistics and all that stuff. But I, I said Russia won't invade right now. They said, why? And I said, because Russia is a nation and the Russian government is ruled by law, believe it or not. It's their law. It ain't our law, but it's their law. And there are things that have to happen before you can talk about an invasion. And I spelled it out. I said, first of all, Russia will not operate in violation of the United Nations Charter. So they will have to come up with a cognizable case for invasion. And right now, the only one they have is um, preemptive self-defense. But to get preemptive self-defense, Russia will have to form a security relationship with the Donbass, a formal security relationship, which will require the Donbass to, you know, not only declare their independence, but for Russia to recognize that independence. And then once Russia recognizes that independence, then Russia will have to go through, you know, the president will have to go to the Duma. The Duma will have to approve something, go to the, to the Senate, and then the Senate takes it back to the president who then signs it. And then and only then can we talk about military intervention. Now, this can take place in a short period of time. But I can promise you, guarantee you, that Russia ain't crossing the border until that happens. And if we're not seeing that happen, then there will be no military intervention. And everybody's like, oh, it's got up. Well, everything I said is 100. That's what happened. In February, uh, they, Russia began the process. Now, they did it in a very compact period of time. But every step that I said had to be taken was taken. Why? The rule of law. Putin is not a dictator. Putin is governed by the rule of law. He can... He is not permitted to do things on a whim. And um, it's the same thing. If he wants to, <laughs> Russian troops <coughs> cannot operate outside of the border of Russia without the permission of the, 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 the Duma. <laughs> he would have to go to them constitutionally and say, hey, uh, I'd like to send troops to Poland. <laughs> because he can't just send troops to Poland. And then the Duma would say, why? The, what is why are we doing this? What is the threat? And normally the only reason to justify it is Poland attacked us. Ah, so we have to sort of wait for that one. And that's the thing. It, it, in, in order for him to do anything to, to begin mobilizing, he can't just mobilize. Why didn't he have 300,000 troops already mobilized to go into Ukraine? Because to justify the mobilization, you need legal justification. He didn't have it. Didn't have it. Couldn't go to the Duma. Couldn't, couldn't justify it. None of the steps that would be required for Russia to attack Europe uh, are, are in place. Uh, first of all, it's not in Russia's doctrine. Their entire approach, and you, you hit it on the head, their defense. Now, the Russians are very good at the counteroffensive. So if we attack them, Russian defensive doctrine is to receive the attack, to destroy the attack, and then to counterattack. And you counterattack to destroy the political center of the beast that attacked you. So yeah, if you want Russian troops in Warsaw, if you want Russian troops in Berlin, attack Russia. But otherwise, don't worry about it because it isn't going to happen. Don't start nothing. Don't it won't, it won't be nothing. Won't be nothing. <laughs> I like it. Uh Alexei Navalny. Yeah. Described as and this is the description, the dominant Western narrative, described as Russian President Putin's most formidable domestic opponent fell unconscious and died at polar wolf arctic penal colony biden described him as a powerful voice for the truth what has happened to navaldi is yet more proof of putin's brutality no one should be fooled well the first thing is if that was true then what does this say about Biden's unyielding support for genocide in Gaza? What does that say about his brutality looking at the thousands and the tens of thousands that people have fought? But that's not the point. If you could quickly 
unpack the myth of Vladimir of um, of uh, Alexei Navalny and the alleged poisoning and all of that stuff to kind of dispel this myth that Putin has assassinated his uh, most formidable domestic opponent. Okay. First of all, we have to understand that the United States government has been in the business of trying to control Russian politics since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The decade of the 1990s was premised on an American policy of promoting democratic reform uh, inside Russia. But what it means through by that is by creating institutions that are controlled by the United States. And banking. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, money is everything. And... Um, what we did in the 1990s is we started using uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, we'd set up these uh, civic societies, these groups for you know furtherance of democracy, and then we would fund them uh, through various uh, fronts, like the National Endowment for Democracy, which in 1983 was created to take over the covert political action functions of the CIA and make it more overt. Uh, the U.S. Congress created it, funneled money to it. There's a Democratic branch, there's a Republican branch, they filter money in. The whole idea is, again, to create, is to fund so-called democratic institutions uh, that will lead to the restructuring of a society the way we want it to be restructured. The um, United States did that in Ukraine in 2014 with the, uh, with the color right on coup. Well, we did it, well, <laughs> we did it before that. If you remember back in the early 2000s, um, we did a color revolution in Serbia. Mm -hmm. It was a very successful color revolution. And so we use that as a template that would then repeat it in Georgia. And then we repeat it in, um, in, in Ukraine. Remember 2004, 2005, the orange revolution. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that we were actively trying to do a color revolution in Russia in 2007, 2008. Why that time period? Again, I don't want to bore people, but this is very important. Vladimir Putin became president uh, in, in end of 1999. He won uh, uh, an election in March of 2000, constitutionally, he got to run for two terms. Uh, those two terms, it, it became clear that he was not going to continue the Yeltsin policy of doing whatever the United States wanted to be done, that he was going to um, try to reform Russia in a Russian image, which we didn't like. So we were pouring money into Russia through these non-governmental organizations for the purpose of carrying out a color revolution in 2007, 2008. The way we were going to do it is in 2007 was the parliamentary elections. The idea of the 2007-2008 period was that Putin couldn't stand a third term as president, so he was going to do a swap with Dmitry Medvedev, who at that time was the prime minister. So Putin was going to become prime minister. Medvedev would become president. But for this to happen, United Russia, which was Putin's party, had to win the parliamentary election. If the opposition could deny United Russia the majority, then Putin couldn't become prime minister. And if Putin couldn't become prime minister, then Medvedev was vulnerable as president and you could pick him off and suddenly you've swept Putin out of power. This is literally the stated objective of the United States. And we started pouring money into Russia to promote this. One of the guys that got caught up in this was a young lawyer named uh, Alexei Navalny. Um, he started, you know, working. I mean, it's, it's CIA all the way. Look, the, the the CIA trained some people. One of them was uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this Yevgenia Albat. She's a journalist, uh, but she went to Harvard, got groomed by the CIA, whether she knew it or not. But she left. The volley went to Yale. Well, later on, yes, he okay. went to Yale in okay. 2010. But okay. Albat comes in in 2004 and she sets up this political parlor. Now, she comes from Harvard. She got her PhD. She comes to Russia. The first thing she does is sets up this political par parlor funded by. British money coming from oligarchs funneled to her through uh, British intelligence. Um, and this parlor attracts these young people, including Navalny, and their job is to create a youth movement that can lead to a color revolution. He's, you know, that that's his whole thing. Bottom line is it failed. It failed miserably. But Navalny was identified at that point in time as, uh, you know, somebody with potential. He started this anti-corruption campaign when Medvedev became the the president, Medvedev said, I'm, I'm against corruption. Navalny went, good, let me help you. And he jumped on this thing. <clears throat> he got picked to go to Yale in 2010, where he was groomed by the CIA. For what purpose? The next target was, okay, we couldn't stop Putin from doing the swap in 2007, 2008. What we can do now is keep Medvedev in power. 
we can prevent Putin from coming back into office in the 2012 presidential election. Remember Hillary Clinton working the opposition, Michael McFaul going in there? It's a big deal. Navalny became the front man for this. He went to Yale. He got dipped in Greece by the CIA, and he got sent back to Russia. He's a CIA asset straight up, funded by British intelligence, trying to overthrow or prevent Putin from coming back in power. Well, you know, what's that thing? Uh, if you don't start nothing, there won't be nothing. Don't start nothing, won't be nothing. <laughs> well, Navalny, I mean, before he went to Yale, he spent uh, a summer in Kirov, uh, which is a province about 800 kilometers east, northeast of Moscow. He got involved in restructuring the timber business, um, and it looked like he might have done some things that weren't uh, so good. Normally, that would be ignored, but he comes back and he immediately starts attacking, um, you know, the interest, the economic interest behind United Russia and, and Putin. And so you started something. OK, so they opened up a criminal case against him. And now you have this situation where Navalny is trying to make himself relevant. And look, he had some traction early on. He was he ran for mayor of Moscow and he got 27 percent of the vote. That ain't bad. But he didn't have any traction outside of Moscow. He couldn't get the kind of numbers necessary to win. But he was a pain in Putin's side. So they started legal, you know, this this legal stuff against him, and it ended up in him being convicted of a uh, of fraud and embezzlement. Some people call it politically motivated. There's no doubt it was politically motivated, but that doesn't mean that the crime didn't take place. Mm -hmm. He got a suspended sentence. Um, he's on parole. Uh, they're trying. They basically they did this to keep him from running. They said if you know because you're convicted, you can't run for for office. Um, something needed to happen. And so in 2020, um, he was poisoned, but he wasn't. I, I, again, I don't want to get too much down the conspiracy track, but let me just put it this way. His medical records clearly show that he wasn't uh, poisoned by Novichuk. This was a setup to get him out of Russia where he had been effectively neutered over into a safe area. And we know that he landed in Germany. He was flown into Germany, had a miraculous recovery. Um, by December, wait he's had it. Wait a minute had a miraculous recovery from Novichok, which from my understanding is one of the most dangerous nerve agents created. I've read it's so dangerous, it really can't even be used. The, the story was <laughs> that he was poisoned at the airport. They poisoned his tea before he got on the plane. No, I no. They poisoned his underwear in his hotel well, no, no. room. <laughs> but that, wasn't that afterwards? Because the story know. changed. The story changed a couple of times. That, that, that's my point. That the that that they said that they poisoned his tea in the airport. If if I understand it, if you were to put Novichuk in a cup of tea, damn near everybody, at least in that area of the airport, would be dead. Yes. Then they then they said, Oh, they poisoned his water bottle on the plane. Novichuk is so toxic that if they had done that, everybody, including the dead. pilot would be dead. Yeah. Then they poisoned his underwear. The story yes. kept and but and, and this is also interesting to me is that during all of these changing of the stories, Russia kept saying, send us the toxicology report so that we can investigate this. No toxicology report was ever presented. Yeah. Again, I, I I'm not a big conspiracy guy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like it. I, I, I'm, I'm a Occam's razor kind of person, but the problem is Occam razor points to this because we did get the, uh, to, you know, the toxicology, not the ones that the, 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 the Germans and, the, and everybody was saying, prove Novichuk. Just, Wilma, you're hundred percent right. This is the most deadly substance on the planet, but apparently it can't kill anybody. It and by the way, the, 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 the whatever the, whatever the new, name of the KGB is, they're pretty good at assassinating folks, as is the CIA. Yeah. If they want you done, cancel five your bullets, business and cancel five your... Bullets, five bullets in the front of your body you, tends to do it. You don't have to mess around with Novichuk. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, just look, a Ukrainian pilot, a Russian pilot defected uh, earlier this year uh, to Ukraine. Um, and had two of his crew members killed as a result. I mean, he's a murderous traitor in the eyes of the Russians. They just found his body in Spain with five bullets pumped into the front of it. That's how the Russians get you. Um, they don't okay. go around doing this Novichuk stuff. But the point is, this Novichuk was a manufactured event. Uh, it didn't happen. What, they, what the German doctors who treated him released 
the the blood work and everything, it showed that Navalny had a whole bunch of different health issues, some serious health issues. And he was also, they found um, evidence of uh, antidepressants, um, which, which is okay. I'm not, I'm not attacking him. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody, you know, you, it's not a problem, but it looks like he deliberately overdosed on antidepressants to generate the result that happened so he could be flown out. This was a pre-planned event. Okay. I just want everybody to understand that, that Navalny deliberately overdosed on antidepressants to generate a medical crisis that then got him flown out of Russia. Cause remember he's on house arrest. He has a, he can't leave but they got him out. What's the first thing that happens after his miraculous recovery? They fly him to Germany to a CIA safe house where a film crew comes in and they produce two feature length documentaries in one month, one month, including elaborate computer generated graphics, the whole thing. He claims that he came up with the idea while he was recovering from his hospital bed and wrote it in a feverish mind in October, November. Wilmer, I've made a documentary and I'm making one right now. I can guarantee you they didn't get it done in a month. This was prepackaged by the CIA and, and British intelligence. And then he, he was, everybody's saying, stay in Germany. And he went, no, I'm going back. Why? Again, in 2021, these election cycles matter. In 2021, Putin was going to change the constitution so that he could um, continue to run for office. And he changed the length of the term from four years to six years. He was restructuring the government and everybody who was anybody, including myself, looked at it and went, he's basically guaranteeing that the West will never subvert Russian democracy by, by mm-hmm. doing this. He's iron proofing it, you know, bu- bulletproofing it. And so the last chance to get rid of Vladimir Putin was to disrupt this effort. Navalny was picked as the guy to do it. Navalny's job was to go back to Russia, stand trial. And while he's standing trial, they're going to release these documentaries. The first one was called Putin's Palace, which was supposed to expose the corruption of Putin and everything. And the idea that it would generate so much unrest inside Russia that Navalny would be acquitted, put in, become the presidential candidate to oppose Putin. That was the dream. The problem is the people coming up with that didn't understand that Navalny had no support in Russia. Never did. Could never get it outside of Moscow. You couldn't get 5%. You might get 12% in Kabarovsk. But that's it. You're not going to win an election with 12% support. The, the numbers well, I saw for him was about somewhere between two and five percent, more on the two percent side. Nation nationwide, like yeah. I said, there's certain bubbles in there where right. he could get support, but nationwide he wasn't going anywhere on this. So he he goes back, and the Russians, what's that? <laughs> don't want nothing. Don't start nothing. The Russians know exactly what's going on. I mean, look, Peskov, who's the press spokesperson, in mm-hmm. October of 2020, uh, you know he. He said, we, we know what's going on. The, it, it, Navalny's working with the CIA. We know this. We know everything. Um, and so they brought him back, and they knew what his plan was. They knew what he was supposed to do. So they quickly just, just, turned just really to- quickly, because that's, pre- that's what President Putin said to uh, Tucker Carlson he said, when, he, when he talked about, um, uh, it's good that, this, that, that you applied to the CIA and that, and that they did not accept you. I yeah. mean, he, he was sending a message. That we I know. Meant- I, I know who you are. I know what you do. Yeah. Well, so here's the deal. Uh, the Russians said, we're, we're not playing this game anymore. We've been, you know, we've let Navalny do this stupid stupidity. Uh, we, you know, because he, he's irrelevant, but now you're playing, the CIA is playing a serious game of messing around with our democracy. So we're just going to end it. Um, Navalny, the hammer's coming down. Boom. Nine years. Boom. 30 years. You're in jail for life. Goodbye. Get out of here. Now they did that. And then, what a lot of people it just came out and build. Then the Russians turned around and said, okay, we know he's your spy. Do you want him back? We'll trade him for, for a guy that we want back from Germany. Now here's the part that gets conspiratorial. Two days minute, before he died. Go ahead. Before, before you get there, isn't there also footage of Navalny or one of his representatives, but I think it's him talking to MI6 about money, about how much money he's going to need to sustain this democracy movement in Russia. Yeah. 2012, uh, Navalny's deputy uh, met with a member of MI6 in Moscow. Um, again, how did they get the video? Because the Russians know everything. <laughs> I mean, when people are sitting there going, Evan Gershowitz isn't a CIA spy, he couldn't be. I just want to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, the Russians have him on film 
um, talking about this, about receiving the documents. It's conspiratorial. Putin was very clear about it. Um, he's a CIA spy. And Navalny, the Russians know who was paying for him. They know this. So they're sitting there going, we want to give him back. Uh, but that's the last thing the CIA wants. Why? Because then they, they have to admit that, you know, we're messing around in Russian you know, politics. politics. Um, they can't. So this is the part that this is what I firmly believe, because I believe that Navalny was induced by his handlers to deliberately overdose on depressants in 2020 to get him out, to get involved in the CIA operation, to come back in and disrupt the election. That is clear. Two days before he died, he was visited by his lawyer. Uh, some people say that his wife was there as well, and they brought medication. That's documented. Have you seen Godfather 2? Uh pff. So many times, I can't tell you how many. Freddie Five Fingers. Freddie Five Fingers. Okay, so Tom Tom goes to talk to Freddie Five Fingers. You just take a nice warm bath. You slip nice your warm bath, open up your veins. And my family the, take, the family will be taken care of. Throws the cigar away, shakes his hand, and it's understood. Navalny's daughter got a free ride to Stanford, courtesy of Michael McFall. Navalny's wife... Um, now has been appointed. I mean, she was at the Munich Security Conference ready to step in before he died. He died. The script comes in. Boom. She's now the new figure of the opposition. She's not tainted by crime. She's at Navalny. Fact, that's the that's that's a headline in the Washington Post today. Yeah, she's the new face of the opposition right. because Navalny had been neutered by the Russians, but as long as he was alive, he was a problem for the CIA. So. Um, Freddie Five Fingers, that's all I'm going to say. Um, he was told, you know, your family will be taken care of. All they have to do is uh, lie in the tub and uh, open up my veins, and it's a, it's a, it's a quiet, painful death. <clears throat> he overdosed on the drugs they gave him. He went for a walk, and he died. Didn't come and, back. Um, his family's taken care of, and that's what I believe happened. I believe that the CIA knocked this guy off in prison. He took a long walk on a very short pier. Yeah. Uh, so you've got, uh, Alexander, the butcher, Sarsky, Sirsky, the commander of Ukraine's ground forces since the start of the military operation. He is now the new military chief after Vladimir Zelensky replaced Zeluzhny, uh, in this, uh, leadership shakeup. What does that tell us at this stage of the game? What, do, what does that type of move tell us? Are they transitioning now to another phase of this process, recognizing that the war is lost? Um, again, everything has to have a setup because nothing happens in a vacuum. Ukraine is called the greatest democracy in the world. We know that's not true, but it's called the greatest democracy in the world by America. Who's we overthrew it in 2014. Yes. And so we would know. <laughs> but the key aspect of democracies is civil military relations, meaning that the civilian is the commander in chief and the military always obeys the orders. Let's look at American history. Uh, George McClellan, Abraham Lincoln. McClellan was the commander of the Army of, uh, uh, of, of the Potomac, and um, he thought he knew how to win this war. And uh, Abraham Lincoln disagreed and fired him. And McClellan said, sir, yes, sir. And he resigned because civil military relations, that's what you do. McClellan went on to challenge Lincoln in the, uh, in the elections and, uh, and lost, but he, he didn't launch a coup. That's not what you do. Douglas MacArthur, uh, during the Korean War, thought he knew how to win the war, wanted to drop atomic bombs on China. Uh, Harry Truman said, nope, that's not how we're going to do it. And uh, they met in Midway, and uh, Truman fired him. And MacArthur went, sir, yes, sir, and he, and he resigned. Um, that's what civil military relations is supposed to be in a democracy. Zelensky met with Zeluzhny, who's the commander of the Ukrainian armed forces. And he said, um, I don't like the fact that you're articulating policy that goes against what I want. I want to be more aggressive. I have to go out and sell this conflict to the West. And I, I have to sell it that we're going to regain all the lost territory. And you as the general are supposed to say, sir, yes, sir. But you've gone out and given interviews behind my back saying it's a frozen conflict, a stalemate. I can't do that. You're fired. And Zeluzhny said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and Zelensky went, but you, and Zeluzhny said, not only am I not fired, but here, 
Let me show you this. Here's my picture given a medal to a right sector Nazi from the organization said they're going to hang you from the neck and if you ever go against this. And behind me is a picture of Stepan Bandera and the right sector flag. Go ahead and fire me now, Zelensky, because you're a dead man walking. And when Zelensky started calling people up saying, is Zelensky saying no? One of the people he called up was Sersky, who said, uh, I just want to tell you right now, Mr. President, that myself and the entire Ukrainian general staff support Zeluzhny. You fire him, we come marching. It's over. And now Victoria Nuland and everybody's back there going, can't do this, guys. We're supposed to be giving $64 billion to the world's greatest democracy. We're against coups, and you're getting ready to launch a coup. She flies in, panicked. And so she cuts a deal. She explains to everybody, if, there's, if you do this coup, um, we can't support you. It's over. And then you're gonna, you're all going to die. And the generals realized that. And they went, yeah, we, we understand that. Zelensky realized that. So Zeluzhny stepped aside. Zelensky took over. But understand what happened. It's a coup. There's one man in charge of Ukraine today, and his name is not Volodymyr Zelensky. His name is Sersky. He's the commander of the Ukrainian armed forces, and they're calling the shots. How do we know this? Because within days of him coming in, he said, we're going over to the general defensive. He's calling the shots. Zelensky said, we'll never leave um, at Vievka. Sersky came in and said, get him out. Pull him out. Redestroy the line. We're going to be pulling back. Uh, the, the military's in charge. And now you have some interesting things because um, the coup we didn't want to happen may happen because the nationalists are all upset, um, you know, and, and there's talk about driving on Kiev right now. The Nazi Ukraine's nationalists are you talking about? Yeah, the Nazis. The, 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 Nazis. the, 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 the right sector guys who became Azov, who, who now have renamed themselves. They're the third assault brigade. And everybody's going, there's no Nazis in, in Ukraine because there, there's nothing called the Azov, except the Nazis are so stupid. They say, nah, third assault brigade, we're Azov. And they do it right on camera, sig hiling, all this kind of stuff. Patches the West everywhere. Are, yeah, we 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 don't know. We we don't want to see this guy just call himself the third assault brigade. But um the no, the Nazis are there, they're upset. <laughs> it's a mess right now. But the uh, America, I'm just telling everybody's list right. There was a coup d'etat in 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 Ukraine. The generals are in charge. Zelensky's a figurehead right now, but the people calling the shot is the military now. That's a new reality. I just want to quickly uh take a step back and um to, to the point you were making about Navalny, to those that think what you're saying is fanciful and crazy, uh, the United States did a similar action. They didn't kill him, but they did a similar action in Venezuela with Juan Guaido. They, the United States told the world that Juan Guaido was the president of Venezuela, even though Nicolas Maduro is the democratically elected president. And when Guaido failed, now the United States is trying to do the same thing with a woman named Marina Machado. And she has been uh, convicted by the Venezuelan Supreme Court as having worked with, I think it's Peru, against the interests of Venezuela. So the Venezuelan Supreme Court said, because you've gone outside the country and tried to overthrow this government, you are no longer qualified to be a, uh, a candidate for president, the United States is trying to ignore the dictate, the decision of the Venezuelan Supreme Court and put this woman in place anyway. I bring that up just to show that what you have talked about in terms of, um, um, I now forgot the guy's name. Um, Navalny, is, Navalny, Navalny, <laughs> Navalny, Navalny. The United States is doing this in doing this a number of places, and Venezuela is the most recent. But, but Wilmer, yeah. How about how about President Diem in Vietnam? Well, we can go. I mean, you know, for people going, oh, this is fanciful. This is right. out of a no, guys. We do it all all the, the time. time when leaders become inconvenient to the, the Shah of Iran, the Shah of Iran, the Shah right. Saddam Hussein. I just want to remind people one of the the more interesting. Um, I I I I was involved with a lot of defectors, Iraqi defectors, in my time as a UN weapons inspector. And one guy that I interviewed many many times was Wafik Samara. He was the head of military intelligence uh, for Saddam. He uh, he ended up being in London and run by the Brits. So I'd go there, and the MI6 would take you to a safe house, and Wafik would come in, and we'd have long conversations. 
And uh, I tried to extract information from him that could lead to good inspections. But he just sat there and he talked about how the U.S. intelligence would fly in uh, because the place I, I wanted to inspect was a specific office with a specific safe. And he said, hey, when you're in that safe, um, if you go down to this drawer, boom, you might find some photographs that you recognize. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, that's where we kept the American spy satellite photographs that were given to us by American intelligence officers who came in and sat in that conference room right next to it. You'll see it when you go in there. I did. Um, and we met there and they would brief us on the spy satellites, give us the newest signals intelligence, laying out the Iranian ground forces. And they helped us plan the chemical weapons attacks against the Iranians in 1988 at al -Fau. We had this wonderful relationship. He gave me the names of all the guys that he worked with. What I'm trying to say is, ladies and gentlemen, there was a time, like in 1988, 1989, where Saddam was our boy. Mm -hmm. We were, we were, you know, U.S. intelligence was there. Then Saddam became inconvenient. He, he fired Scud missiles at Israel, which is a capital crime. And we ended up going to war, removing them and hanging, having them hung by the neck until dead because his continued survival would have been inconvenient for America. Let me just make it as clear as this. Navalny had become inconvenient because the Russians were sitting on the Russians never go public about anything, and their words mean everything. And when Peskov said in October of 2020, this, we know what the CIA is doing. The CIA, we know who he's working mm -hmm. with. We know what's happening. Um, it meant they know. They know everything. They have all the financials. They have all the videotapes. They have everything. And the U.S. knew it, too. That interview with Tucker is very telling. He said, you know, I, I'm not going to talk to Biden. There's really nothing for me to say. But he says, mm -hmm. our special services are talking. They're talking the language of the special services. Having been in the special services and engaged in those kind of conversations, they're very frank because we don't have to play games. Mm -hmm. When you sit down with somebody and they know what your background is, we don't have to pretend. We talk about human recruitment. We talk about technical surveillance. We talk about the tools of the trade. We talk about the language that we know is going on. And so when the special services of Russia sit down with the special services of the CIA and say, we know exactly what you guys did. You met here. Boom, boom, boom. We got the goods. He's your boy. Do you want him back? And the CIA went, nope, <laughs> we don't want him back. <laughs> We're going to have a lawyer visit him. And again, it, it may sound something like out of a movie. But remember, Hollywood gets its greatest cues from reality. Frank Pantangeli, Freddie Five Fingers. Freddie Five Fingers, baby. Favorite scene in the world. And it's real. I mean, I'm writing an article. I'm giving away my my article, but I'm I'm writing an article that this is going to be explained in great detail. And I and, and I talk about Freddie Five Fingers. So, the next point here that I want to get to with you quickly is Mike Turner, Republican of Ohio, chair of the House Intelligence Committee. He's warning that Russia may be developing a space based weapon that could target U.S. satellites. And a lot of the narrative that's surrounding uh, what he said over last weekend is the is that now Russia has violated uh, the, the, the the there were some treaties I think signed in the mid '80s that the countries agreed that they would not militarize space. But what seems to be left out of this conversation is that I think when the United States announced the Space Force, that was militarization of space. Therefore, the treaty that they now want to wrap themselves in and call foul based upon, uh, really, the United States has already violated it. So yeah. go ahead. Well, the treaty is a 1967 treaty, the Outer Space oh, Treaty. Okay. And it, it, it um, talks about, it doesn't say demilitarization. What it says is uh, that space should be used for exclusively peaceful purposes. Okay. And that... Um, Nobody should deploy nuclear weapons in this in the space. Now, what Turner has, it's it's I mean, the, the show the stupidity of Mike Turner and, and these people. Um apparently there's raw intelligence. That's the term that's used. And that's that's mm -hmm. an important phrase. Um finished intelligence is when I collect information, I corroborate it with different sources, you I connect assess the dots. I connect the dots. That's right. Bingo. Good job, Wilmer. <laughs> and, uh, and you connect the dots, and then you write up an assessment that it's fact-based. But here's the important thing. You disguise the sources of information. 
Because if you're going to release finished intelligence to a congressman or Congress, they do what politicians do. They talk. They bring in somebody, hey, read this. You're not supposed to write about it, but wink, wink, read this. And they go, oh, my God, the Russians are going to put a nuclear weapon in space. You know, what are we going to do about it? Okay, that's finished intelligence gets leaked all the time. Everybody does it. The president on down. It's just the name of the game in Washington, D.C. Raw intelligence, though, is almost never leaked. Why? Because raw intelligence means we haven't protected the source. So Turner released raw intelligence. He released a raw intelligence report uh, to Congress. He put it in the reading room and said, everybody needs to come and read this thing. Um, now, a lot of people did, a lot of people didn't, but it created a storm because he issued a public statement, which means the media now, because he knows how the game's played. Now, every reporter worth their salt in Washington, D.C. is calling their congressional source saying, what the hell is on that report? <clears throat> and people start talking. So what we do know now is that the Russians um, are developing an anti-satellite capability that incorporates a nuclear device designed to generate an electromagnetic pulse uh, that, that can shut down all of our satellites in outer space. Now, why is this important? Understand this. Turner released his report on Wednesday, knowing that on Thursday, the Gang of Eight, the four senators, four uh, Republicans from the Intelligence Committee, the leadership, was going to meet with the White House, the National Security Council, about this very report and talk about it. So why would you release it when they're already going to talk about it? What are you trying to do? And this... On Wednesday, the day he released his report, SpaceX sent up a Falcon 9 rocket with two satellites. These satellites were experimental missile monitoring satellites, part of a constellation of satellites that the United States started deploying last year. We, we deployed 28 of them last year. It's going to be a constellation of hundreds. It's sort of like a militarized Starlink. And the purpose of this constellation is to give America total control over the informational domain. That means that we communicate faster, we navigate, we can target, we can collect, we've militarized space. And the Russians have said, they've written reports to the Secretary General saying, hey, this is a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, you're militarizing space, you're creating an advantage at a time when you say you want to strategically defeat Russia. Remember, that's the American objective. And the Russians are saying, um, if you do this, uh, you could launch a first strike against us, um, and we might not be able to respond. You're getting a unilateral advantage here. And if we do go to war, you're going to have this total control over intelligence collection, communications, et cetera, that gives you an operational and tactical advantage. Um, we can't allow this to happen. So what the Russians did is they developed a weapon. They haven't deployed it yet, but it's a weapon that it will go up, and in one blinding flash of a moment that doesn't threaten any life here in America. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're going up there with a giant dirty bomb. It's going to be a neutron type device, a small device that's geared towards emitting radiation, the pulse, and it's going to blind the entire, in an instant, shut down this entire satellite network. But here's the important thing from Turner's perspective. <clears throat> the entire American military approach to war depends on this. Mm -hmm. If we don't have this satellite thing, we put every, talk about putting all the eggs in one basket. We have literally put all the eggs in one basket. Everything we do depends on this. If you shut that satellite network down, ladies and gentlemen, we can't go to war. We can't go to war. It's over. And Turner knows it. So what Turner's trying to do is say, guys, why are we investing all this money? Because we're this is going to go on for years. When we know the Russians can undo it, this is stupid. We need to either get involved in arms control to prevent this from happening, or we need to come up with a backup plan because these satellites ain't going to work the way you want them to work when you want them to work. So that's noble. But here's the problem. He released raw intelligence, which means the Russians now know how we collected it. And at a time when we need to have continued access to this stream of reporting, now more than ever, let's imagine the president says, hey, uh, what are the Russians up to today on that satellite thing, the thing we've been monitoring? You know, you guys came to me and you said, hey, boss, we put a, I don't know how they did it. You know, we mm. put a, a, we tapped a cable and now we're listening to the conversations of these guys. Oh, wow, that's cool. 
okay, but boss, we can't talk about it. We can't mention the following words because if we mention the following words, the Russians will know what conversation we listen to and then they'll stop communicating. Well, raw intelligence gives you those final, those words. It wasn't finished product. Mike Turner compromised his source. We will never listen to them again at a time when we actually need to be monitoring this to come up with a strategy. Remember, let's say we want to do the right thing for once in our pathetic lives as Americans. And um, we say, maybe it's time we do engage in arms, meaningful arms control. This is when we need to know what Russian intent is. How far along are they? Are they going to deploy this? Is this something that the Russians are doing to get to the negotiating table? Or is this something that the Russians are going to keep no matter what? What's going on? Because it affects our negotiating strategy. We don't know now because Mike Turner released the raw intelligence to do an honorable thing to get people because he knew that that they were going to sweep it under the rug. He knew that the gang of eight in the White House were just going to go, no, we're not going to worry about this. We're going to keep deploying the satellites. And he's going, that's stupid. But now we we're blind. And that's why I call it Turner's folly. I mean, he trying to do the right thing. He did the absolute wrong thing. And now at a time when we need to have this intelligence, it's not there. I know there's a lot of people out there who thinks intelligence is a bad word and it's been misused throughout history. There's no doubt about that. But I'm here to tell you right now that collecting information of this nature is absolutely essential to the national security of the United States because you want our leaders to be informed about the potential threats that exist around the world. And there's a need for intelligence. Not irres- I'm not talking about violating American constitutional mm-hmm. rights. I'm not talking about do- – I'm saying there's a need for people like me who did it honorably. It's a tough job. It's a dangerous job. Sometimes you have to do things that, you know – you wouldn't want to talk about at the PTA, Um, Mm -hmm. but it's the reality of the world that you have to go out there and you have to get this information so that your leaders are informed so they can make the right decisions. And Mike Turner has cost us that information at a time when we desperately need it. Final question for you. And that surrounds NATO and Donald Trump's comments about NATO. And there seems to be an awful lot of furor about his talking about, you know, defunding NATO and all this kind of stuff, when all that I can read and understand is that NATO is now really obsolete and that it's a money laundering scheme. Yeah. Let me put it this way. There's a um, <coughs> foreign minister of Lithuania, Lands Burgess, out there. And he's, just, I mean, Lithuania, the Baltic countries, Lithuania, mm-hmm. Estonia, Latvia, they're making a lot of noise right now about Article 5, and how it's essential that NATO must, you know, come to the collective defense. And, but Lithuania is talking about, for instance, blockading Kaliningrad, the uh, Russian enclave on the Baltic Sea. They're talking about uh, sanctions. They're talking about a whole bunch of stuff that could lead to a war with Russia. And they're saying that's okay because we're NATO and NATO will protect us. The American people need to understand that Lithuania has a population of 2.8 million. The greater East Coast megapolis from boston to washington dc is 50 million people do you really think that we're going to sacrifice 50 million people to defend 2.8 million people who are kicking a hornet's nest right now the answer is no um you know the, the and that's the bottom line about nato the american people are waking up to the fact that nato is not about defending europe from the the the, the evil russians nato is a suicide pill Because you have nations like Poland, you have nations like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, that think that because they have this NATO shield behind them, they can behave aggressively to Russian and not have any consequence to it. If they start a war against Russia and a blockade of Kaliningrad is an act of war, Russia will respond militarily. And now if you're Joe Biden, it's a sacred thing. Every inch of NATO soil is sacred. Article 5 is a sacred. No, it's a suicide pill. It's a trap having poodles trying to get the Rottweilers to fight. Um, NATO is an organization that has outlived its usefulness. Donald Trump, you know, he's not the most eloquent person or the most articulate person. And there's a lot about him that just cannot be supported 100%. But I'll tell you right now, he's speaking the mind of many Americans when he says, we ain't doing this anymore. We're not paying your bills. We're not going to be there for you when you want to kick a hornet's nest. We don't want to get stung. So you're on your own. We don't. And that's what's going to happen. I, I'm predicting that NATO, you know, it may not last 10 years. Um, you know, it, it's out. It's on its way out because it's 
here's the thing. Remember, we talked about mobilization at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We talked about mobilization. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's funny to watch the the schizophrenia that exists in people like Jan Stoltenberg, you know, who stutters his way through everything. Russia is evil, and we must we must stand up to Russia. NATO must too. Oh, but we cannot afford to mobilize right now. We have no money. Our industry is no longer working. And uh, we don't, but America will pay for it because NATO is a, 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 I mean, it's going back and forth. NATO can't mobilize right now because they don't have the industrial base to mobilize. Not only that, nobody wants to be part. The British who are out there, Boris Johnson doing that ridiculous thing. Lance Corporal Johnson reporting, sir. We're going to mobilize the people. First of all, you know, Britain has two aircraft carriers they built for, I forget how many billions of dollars. They can't get out of port because they don't work. They build a whole bunch of new frigates, brand new modern frigates to defend these aircraft carriers, but they don't have enough sailors. So in order to get the sailors on these new frigates, they have to retire frigates that are still good. So their military, we're going to fight the Russians. I mean, you hear this British general, we're going to be on the front lines of the next war with Russia. With what? Your military's 70 2,000 right now. You can't fill up a soccer stadium. And in five years, it's going to be 56,000. Nobody wants to join the British military anymore. Nobody's joining the Navy. Nobody's joining anything because the youth of Europe don't believe in Europe. They don't believe they're not willing to give their lives for this pathetic little enterprise called Europe or NATO. So all this talk about 300,000, this, that, mobilize. It's all talk. And that's the good news is it's all talk. But the, and the better news is I think NATO's done because you, you used a word that's very important. And normally, as I said, I shy against conspiracies, but NATO's a money laundering scheme. That's all it is. It's an employment vehicle. I have, I mean, I have to be careful. I have relatives that work for NATO. Uh, they're not Americans. And, um, you know, thank God. I mean, one's married to my sister. So I like the fact he has a paycheck. It keeps my sister, you know, fed and a roof overhead and all that. But the job's not a real job. None of NATO is a real job. It's just an employment vehicle for a political economic elite that automatically fall in on these sinecures because that's what NATO is. It's a sinecure for people just to sit there and collect a paycheck doing nothing. If, if I have the chance to speak to President Biden, and I know he watches the show regularly, <laughs> I I would have to ask him about the sanctity of NATO that he holds so near and dear. If, if you believe in NATO to the degree that you do, Mr. President, why did you engage in an act of war as in blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline? Why did you in, engage in an act of war against a NATO country, that being Germany? Because by doing so, Article 5, the other NATO countries are supposed to respond to Germany's defense in a manner in which they see fit. So I guess the fact that they didn't respond means they didn't see a manner in that they see fit. But I don't hear anybody asking that question. Why, if NATO is NATO and it's sacrosanct as it is, why did you engage in an act of war against a NATO member? That's my final question, Scott Ritter. Well, I mean, it's a great question, but here's here's an even an equally relevant one. Why did the German chancellor stay Agreed. silent right. at the press conference in February when the president said that if Russia invades Ukraine, I'll take out Nord Stream? And when he was asked the question, but it's German, how could you do that? It'll get done, I promise you. And Olaf Scholz is sitting there going, <laughs> not saying a word, <laughs> not saying a word. Right. So, you know. How can you, I mean, the thing about Article 5 is it has to be invoked by the person attacked. And Germany never once said, we've been attacked because they were there when it was designed. Olaf Scholz knew all along that this was going to happen <clears throat> because Germany's not a sovereign state. And that's the thing about NATO that people need to understand. It exists only for the United States. It's the exclusive tool of the United States. It exists to promote American national security interests. And this is why when you have Latvia and Poland now believing that NATO's there for their interests. No, it's not. NATO doesn't exist for anybody's interests but our own. And as Europe wakes up to this reality, they're going to realize that we don't need to be part of NATO anymore because it doesn't benefit us.
and, and, and there's a lot of talk now about a European security right. uh, agency and things of that nature. Yeah. And President Putin asked, I thought, a very relevant as we look at. So people say, well, why did the United States blow up NATO? Well, I mean, blow up Nord Stream uh, basically to deindustrialize Germany, deindustrialize yeah. Europe and have the Europeans start buying natural gas from the United States and other things. Putin, during his speech, said, well, you realize they didn't destroy the entire Nord Stream pipeline. There is one pipe that can still transmit gas. Why don't you open that up? He said, there's the ability to send gas through Ukraine. Why don't you open that up? There's the ability to send gas through Poland. Why don't you open that up? And haven't heard an answer, but that's... that's you, want, you, want, you, you want the best answer? Go ahead. I'll just say this. I grew up in Germany and the car that I loved, I, I was in love with the, the, the Porsche 911 SC oh. Turbo Rough mo Modified. And okay. um, well, guess what's happening, Wilmer? Porsche is moving its production to the United States. Michelin, the French tire company, tire company. Michelin has shut down, I think, two tire plants in Germany and they're moving them I don't know where they're moving them, but they're moving them out of Germany. I know. Could that. you imagine a Porsche plant and a Michelin plant? I tell you what, there's going to be a new car in my driveway pretty soon. It's going to stay <laughs> made in the USA on it. But that's that's what's going on. We've deindustrialized Europe to our benefit, and again, we come back to America doesn't do anything for anybody. We only do it for ourselves. And yeah, Go, Scott Ritter, man, thank you so much. You you fit me in in a real tight schedule today. Thank you so much. Uh, Scott, I really appreciate it. Someday, Wilmer, you're going to have to explain to me what um, extreme golf is, but I'm, I'm just eavesdropping on your uh, wonderful set. Oh, that well, that that's the name of uh, uh, PXG uh, is is the name of the of the golf. Those are the golf clubs that I use. Oh, uh, I thought Par it was like a Par sport. No, no, no. Parsons Extreme Golf is the PXG. That's the that's the brand of golf clubs that I use. Oh, I was thinking like combat golf, where you go out and try and play golf, but people are attacking <laughs> you and tackling you while you putt. No, it's interesting that you say that because on the golf course, I have talked to friends of mine about uh, full contact golf. I like and it. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, man, thank you, thank you, have I really good one. you too, man. Thanks. Hey, folks. I want to thank you all for listening to the Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You get wonderful conversations like I just had with Scott Ritter. Also, please follow and please, please, please subscribe. Follow us on social media. You can find all the links below to the show description. And remember, folks, this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge because talk without analysis is just chatter and we don't chatter on connecting the dots. See you again next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Have a great one. Peace. Connecting the dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.